What's up and welcome to another episode of the Scott and Ian show on the SBL podcast. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good, you guys. It's like fall weather, busting out the fall jackets and shirts. Not that I don't wear them like all the time. Now it's just seasonally appropriate and I feel good about that. Today, the S is different. The I is the same. The S is different. It's not Scott Divine behind the Scott and Ian show. Today, a special treat. Sharon Reynolds. Welcome her to the pod. Scott was on a vacation. Sharon jumped in. We had such a good time. We're talking today about Fender Custom Shop versus Squire. We both have one. And we're talking about uh, what we like about it, what we don't like about it. Ooh, gets juicy. Also, the day I stopped liking Fodera, who was the I behind that sentence? You're just going to have to watch and listen to find out. Let's get Sharon into the action. Check out this episode. Okay. I love the German accent. <laughs> I well, but you speak German and I feel like if I do a German accent it's offensive. But you actually speak German. And so like I can't do it, but you can do it. What do you like I about the have German accent? Full blown conversations with me in a German accent at times it cracks Lydia up. <laughs> with, with you like with yourself? I, no, with like Lydia. Oh, but yeah. I'll just go I'll <laughs> okay. go into like a German accent and I'll do everything with a German accent. It is and it cracks me up. Like it's really hard to keep it up, but it's really funny. Wow. Well, I'll Can do you, this whole pot uh, well, I need, in a German I need accent. A, we need a sample. Let me um let me ask you this. Uh give me I want I want your 30 second review of Barbie in a German accent. Go. <laughs> First of all, I'm not sure I can give you a review of Barbie in 30 seconds because it's just such a vast, like, it touches on so many subjects. It's very, very weird to try and confine it into just a mere 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I mean, I'll take that. <laughs> I do want to talk to you about Barbie, but before we get into that, I want to ask you about you. You just you just spent twelve hours making a reel yesterday, or ten hours, <laughs> something absurd like that. Yeah. Did you? So you were talking about it, and I was like, okay, we just need to roll. Do Do you have ADHD? Um, I I've not been diagnosed with ADHD, but I'm fairly certain that has to do with the fact that my mom went out of her way to not let us be diagnosed with dyslexia or like she wanted us to learn to cope no matter what because back when we were growing up the world did not have Uh. like systems set aside for you to use back then use it as an excuse yeah 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 now it's an actual thing and it's more recognized and you can actually like talk about it and you can like live with it yes it's it's a thing where people yeah and there's empathy more empathy around it more understanding around it and organizationally there is too absolutely mental health days and such before we keep going i'm sorry i this is my fault bump down your mic game a little bit (laughs) because now you're close to it now you're leaning into it and it's like pow peaking (laughs) so sorry (laughs) let's try that um so okay so you didn't go you didn't go in and get the diagnosis, but you think you might be ADHD? I did not get diagnosed, but I also cannot stick with a simple task <laughs> by like a mile. But then when I do get into something, it's like, do not dare talk to me because yeah. I will snap. Like, I'm so in it. I will not even realize that you're like trying to get my attention. I'm just in it. So there's like, it's just two massive extremes. Yep. That sounds like ADHD. (laughs) I sometimes I've wondered that too. You know, I never got a diagnosis, but I am so, so scattered and then crazy hyper focused around tasks. And I was up last night until probably a similar time to you (laughs) making content for, for Dunlop. I recorded some sound samples for the JC wah. I'm just going to play a little, little taste. Oh, hell yeah. Check this out. Check out a little taste. This is never before heard. Let's see. Let's, let's get it. So 
you know what well, I, let yeah. me guess that is just a drum loop and everything is everything else is you yeah yeah badass just drum loop and bass <laughs> guess where the drum loops from i'm gonna give you one guess SBL Groove Trainer. Yes. What? <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. It's so funny. Um, I Whenever I'm making tracks, I want to ask you about this too. I'm ADDing the top of this podcast right now <laughs> because I'm jumping around. But I find drum production to be very difficult. Like if I'm like trying to put a beat together with elements, if I have the opportunity to scroll through kick drums, And it's, and then I get so hyper focused on that finding the right kick drum. I spend Hours. too long, so yeah. I need a loop, you know, or else. God, anybody out there, drums are hard. Help me make it easy. Um, and I, for now, I'm using Groove Trainer. <laughs> that's smart. That's yeah, smart. I got way way back. I got a Splice subscription. Yes, best thing I can recommend. Is for it? Is that true? I was looking at it last night. I was like, I need drums. Maybe I should just get a, a slice splice subscription. Should I? I recommend that the only downside yeah. that I have found so far is that you cannot pause your subscription. So I have literally had this subscription running since my Berkeley times. So I've yeah. had it for like five, six years. What is it? Which 10 means bucks I just a month have, or something? It's like eight bucks, nine okay. bucks a month. Yep. It's, not, it's not like bad. But right. I don't use it, especially I took like COVID break. I wasn't yeah. doing music. So I wasn't using it at all. But but if you want to go and like pause your subscription or delete your account, you lose all the credits that you have like accumulated. So yeah. I can't like and I have like 2000 points and each point is one sample. So oh. I can download like 2000 samples. So so is it not an unlimited? Is there an option to do an unlimited thing with it or do you have I'm sure there is like a higher tier if you like I think you get like on the one that I have, I don't, I don't know, maybe thirty points a month or something. I'm not sure what the exact mm. like ratio is, but you can always buy more. Sure, sure. In sure. addition, I think, but you're just like on a on a roll. So now oh, I that's... have this like accumulative <laughs> points. But if oh, oh, oh Sharon, if you want to take a break from music, you will lose it all. <laughs> you will have spent hundreds of dollars, yes. and it'll all be down the drain. So I've just been like. I guess I'll just hang on to it until I need it again. And I'm just like accumulating more and more points. And then every now and then I need it. And then it's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's how they get you. Right. It's like you don't want to lose the thing that you have been paying for. Right. It's not like you can pay for it for a while and then keep the samples. Uh, oh, I know it's tricky. It's tricky. There was a time where I was making a bunch of like tracks for artists and making drums and stuff. And I was doing it on Ableton with a push like this old controller. And I would spend hours and hours and hours and hours doing it, cycling through libraries. And I was just like, what am I doing? So I should probably do that. But then I just know with splice, I'm going to be doing the same thing, cycling forever through those libraries. There's so much useless crap though. Yeah. That you're just going to be like, no, no. And you're kind of going to go through. I spend way less time on Splice than I do on Ableton trying to find a kick. Okay. I will, usually I'll first check out Splice, and then if I really don't find something, I'll resort to, like, creating it myself, unless I'm doing, like, a sound alike. Like, I did that German pop song a couple yes. of weeks back on the on Instagram. Nana. Yes. <laughs> Such a great song. <laughs> yeah, it is a <laughs> Underrated great song. Underrated For um, sure, you're totally right. And I want it that sound and i just couldn't find that it's like classic like 80s yes or 90 what is it 70s 80s and i and i just i couldn't find it <laughs> like so that I classic just, sound yeah what is it 90s 70s 80s, 60s 50s 40s 30s you know, 20s like 10s <laughs> it's old it's an old an old snare sound definitely not 90s i think it's 80s <laughs> right yes i it's mean that song came out in the 80s <laughs> before, you're like i don't know what is it 1890s <laughs> like i'm like 90s you're like no 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 i'm no i'm talking 1890s i'm like oh damn you field know snare is like snare <laughs> <laughs> that dude's in a field playing snare right now um okay so when you make when you spend a bunch of time making I'm going to go back to this. When you spend a bunch of time making content for SBL for your own thing, how long how long do you spend on how long do you spend on shooting a reel? 
typically? Hmm. I want to say anywhere between two to four hours most days. But when you shot this one last night for you. <laughs> last night, I started production. <laughs> like I started, again, disclaimer, I wrote a 30 second jingle first. Right. And then proceeded to go and film it. And, and I spent like half an hour just standing in my living room going, iPhone or Black Magic? Sorry, I don't have an iPhone. I'm not that rich. Android? <laughs> Or black magic. Also, my Android oh my has like God. 0.3 all you, gigs. All of you Android space. people say the same crap. Oh my God! All everybody that hold on, I'm ranting for a minute. Every <laughs> Android user is like, "Oh, I don't have enough money." Oh, all you rich people. Same thing that people say that edit on PCs and not a Mac. Oh like God. Dan at SBL is like, "Oh, I guess if I had all the money in the world, I'd edit on a Mac." I'm like, "Dude, it's just all it is." is priorities. Everybody that has a job, oh boy, I'm going to get in hot water for this. <laughs> Most people that have some kind of steady income stream could afford an Apple product if they wanted to. They just don't. And then they like to take little jabs at Apple people and say, oh, but if I guess if I was rich, I'd have an iPhone. I have been trying, Ian. I have for about a year now, I've been eyeing that new iPhone because it's got that sexy camera. And I'm like, yeah. I just want it. And every month I'm like, this is the month. And then <laughs> really? I sit down with my bank account and I'm like, I guess this is not the month. <laughs> <laughs> no, I suppose. I know. I, people are going to people are going to hate me for saying that. But it it's funny. It's like everybody talks about but how much how much is the phone that you have? Is it so much cheaper than an iPhone? So yeah, much like, cheaper? First of all, I got it as a gift. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't bought a phone. I don't think I've bought my own phone ever actually. I used the one I got a hand me down from my dad that I used up into half of my Berkeley time. And then my aunt came to visit halfway through Berkeley and she was like, we're going to the app store. Uh, I'm getting everyone a gift because I haven't seen you guys in forever. And like, wow. Lydia got an Apple watch and I got a phone. Um, and but then wait, I was but, with that phone. For but, like, so you had an iPhone? I had an iPhone. I love iPhone. Oh. <laughs> but then <laughs> okay. I was using the iPhone 6 until halfway through COVID. Got it. That's an and old. That was an old like, phone at that point. <laughs> yes, and, yes. And basically, the second I unplugged it, it was like. Mm. So I was <laughs> yeah, just always yeah, walking yeah. around with it, like jacked to something, which is right. just not useful. Right. Um, and then I got a OnePlus T, which is a good phone. It's a good Android, and its battery life is sick. And I've had it now again for like four to five years. But it's time for an upgrade. Waiting for an iPhone. I wish Apple did sponsorships. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they do not hand that stuff out. I mean, I, if you're Pete McKinnon, you know, or if you're, or if you're, uh, oh, I'm trying to think of somebody else that reviews tech. I can't remember their name. They give they give them to some people. They certainly don't give them to me. Dude, really? I've been I've been in that ecosystem for so long. I cannot imagine. Um, I cannot imagine going to a completely different platform because I'm so entrenched. Talk about it's like they horrible. got me. I'm sure because I use iCal all the time. And so like that, that alone, iCal, how it connects to my life. I just can't even that, imagine getting off. That I thought was going to be my main problem is just like all of the how everything is because I use a Mac. I use an iPad. I like I have everything that is Apple except the phone. Except the phone. Yeah. Which sucks. And then I can't airdrop my reels, so you, I actually have to take my videos and I send them to myself on Slack, <laughs> because that's the <laughs> quickest way, because it's still quicker Dude. than uploading it on the drive. It's such a nightmare. <laughs> Dude, get a phone. Although it's funny because I thought you were coming at it from the same place. We have, we have uh, for everybody listening, we've got a guy on the team named Dan who edits, like famously edits on a PC. And I went, there have been a few times when I've been hanging with Dan and it's like crashing and I'm always teasing him. Uh, Scott teases him too. But I thought like for me, I thought when you were like, oh yeah, I can't afford. I thought you like liked the Android thing because it was cheaper, you know, or whatever. But no, you hate it. It sucks. You want to get an iPhone again. The worst part was transferring. But literally the two weeks, I shit you not, <laughs> that it took me to transfer over to the Android. Like yeah. I had to use two phones because my WhatsApp, like there is no good way to transfer from Android to iPhone. It just doesn't yes. exist. So you have to like, 
download everything and back it up manually and then somehow shove it into the end. Like, it just doesn't. It doesn't work. <laughs> Tragic. <laughs> if you're on an iPhone, stay with the iPhone. I don't care if you have to leave it jacked oh, in. Oh, I will. <laughs> oh, we will, Sharon. <laughs> we will. Hey, look what I have. I have a base. Ooh. Yeah, check it out. Do you have a base near have you? Base. Get your base. Always have a base. I love, I love that you have this base. Do, these look similar, right? Yeah, yeah. They do you look similar. That's it's like, right. This is the, the color of your big heart. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I suppose. But this is, yeah, I guess this is sort of. They're both uh, anodized pick guards, but uh, yours is sort of like more goldy colored, I it's guess. So, or maybe my I light is. It. No, no, it is. It's actually one hundred percent like gold colored. Is it metal? Related. Or is it plastic? I think it's metal, actually. Yeah. It yep. feels cold. Yep. I bet it is metal. That's so cool. Sharon and I have P bases, you guys. We have P bases. And one is a custom shop. And the other is a squire. You can't even see the headstock. Now, what's interesting is, I mean, probably if people, if, if people know me, they probably know, or they've watched some videos, they probably know which one is which. But it is interesting to see them in this frame. You wouldn't be able to tell. You know what I mean? Just like this without seeing the headstock. You would not be able to tell which one so is which, which is cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the big reveal. All right. So this is the one that I'm holding ah! is a custom shop. From to, from the Nam show in 2005. Check this out. I got this base on Talk Base uh, in oh, it was a long time ago, but this was built for the Nam show in 2005. It's fancy. It's like uh, a two. It's like a 58 reissue. Has kind of like a chunk, a super chunky V shaped neck, and it's just awesome. And Sharon, what do you have? I got the 40th anniversary Squire edition, the vintage blonde. Yes. And it's so awesome. It's so awesome. And it's like, totally does not. I mean, I bought this instead of an iPhone because it's way cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, and some would say that was a good choice on your part. Oh, yeah. 100%. I use it a lot. I did my reel on this base last night. Did actually. you? Oh, I, I can't did. wait. What I strings did. do you have on that, Sharon? Oh, man. It's the... It's the flat rounds. The, yeah. The ones you recommended. What was it? Fender. Oh, the Fender 9050s. Those are awesome yeah. flats. Those are awesome strings. Very, very cool. I just couldn't see if the silks on it were green at the moment, but they oh. are indeed. Yeah, I also feel like I just heard you twang a string on it. And it sounded like it had a bunch Ooh. of chorus and octave on it. Did oh, it? Maybe. I might be plugged into the HX. Let's see. <laughs> I might be. Are you using the presets, Sharon? Right now, no. Right Boo. now, the preset that's running Boo. is called Barbie because it was for my Barbie reel. Oh, reels. yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear it very well. It's coming through loud and clear. Okay, I have to open up the thing. That's, that's, that's a... Is it your preset? No. Did you teach me how to use the HX? Yes. Yay. So, in a weird way, it is your preset because I am using... Like a lot of the stuff that you showed me, which I I didn't comment specifically on your Barbie reel about the sound, but I thought in my mind that's badass, and I should have said it. It's great. Thank what you. a cool sound. Yeah, I was pretty pumped about it. I think it's the first time. Well, the second time that I actually sat down and like, I'm going to take an hour and I'm going to figure out a sound on this thing. Oh, it's awesome. And it was it was really fun. It was like, yeah. And then, like, God, yeah. sounds are just so cool because they just put you in a completely different headspace. Yeah, make and you it play like completely inspires differently. Inspires you completely differently totally. because it's not like a different tone, different everything, and you're like, "What is this instrument that I'm playing?" I know, I know, I know. It's, it's so true. And like, yeah, if you pick up a P bass versus, I'm sure, picking up the Dingwall that you have. I almost said your Dingwall, but it's mm -hmm. not true. <laughs> What do you mean it's not true? Yeah. What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean it's not true? Um, and oh, I guess it's true. Okay, mm -hmm. let me ask you this: Have you ever played? Have you ever played a custom shop Fender bass before? Ever? I, I don't think so. I don't know what my five is. 
Your five is like an American. You have like a 90s, that sort of green jazz bass, 93, right? 93, 94. Yeah, I wrote to Fender this week. I was like, here's the serial number. It can't be found on your website. Tell me what it is. Oh. And they were like, we don't know, but it's probably 93, 94. Oh, <laughs> I was okay, like, oh, great, weird. thanks. <laughs> it's, it's a jazz bass plus from the 90s. I mean, I remember those in real time. I remember when they came out. I remember people that had them. They're a holdover too. The electronics and the knobs in them are a holdover from when they bought Kubicki. You know the bass that Scott and I have, the factor, yes. Kubicki factor? So they bought that company. So Fender, this is crazy. The Fender Custom Shop started in the late 80s when they acquired Kubicki. And Stu Ham helped facilitate that deal which is wild. Wow. <laughs> he told me that on a blueprint call. Well, he told us that there was, it was <laughs> but it was a small group of people. Yeah. He said that he helped make that happen. So Philip Kubicki, you know, makes this crazy cool race car looking base and Fender buys it. And instead of um, like, just not, not putting any Fender branding on it, they decide to create this custom division a Fender called the custom shop. But they still left the, you know, it was like still called a Kubicki factor. But on the back of those headstocks, they would stamp this like branded stamp that said, you know, it was like an oval and said FCS or Fender Custom Shop or something. And that was the first custom shop. And so then a couple years later, Philip buys the brand back. Fen apparently, like it, it's, a, it's sort of a flash in the pan. Maybe the sales aren't great. That's speculation on my part. Philip is like, you guys are screwing it up. That's also speculation on my part. Whatever. <laughs> he wants it back, right? Philip Kubicki wants it back. He takes it back. And um, Fender is like, well, what what can we do with some of this stuff? And they are able to like roll out. Or, or maybe they only rolled out the electronics and the parts into some other Fender models when they had the brand. That could be. But then. I did yeah. hear someone was asking me about the bass. On yep. Instagram, and I was like, I don't know. So I wrote to Fender, and then I gave him like all that deets, and he was like, Oh, so it must be one of those with the Kubiki electronics. So you're probably right. Yeah, it's it it for sure is. I mean, just seeing the knobs on it, I'm like, oh, I I would know that from a mile away. Um, and they then ended up bailing on all that stuff, so they called it Jazz Bass Plus. I think was the name of it. I think that's what it was. What, does it say that? I don't does know it? it? I feel like you should just get that bass. I'm sorry. It'll be awkward because you'll have to stand up and there's wires no, and all no, that. No, but it's here. Oh, oh, oh my God. Awesome. What does it say? Jazz bass. It doesn't Made say in the plus. USA. It just only says cool. jazz bass. Does it say yeah. it in kind of like a, it's like kind a of really like a cool blocky nineties font, font? Yeah. yeah. Maybe they didn't oh, call it a plus. Here we go. Show us that bass <gasps> is so badass. Yeah. Yep. It's a five string. Can you see that? I can see Destroy it. Destroy it while I'm at it. Great. It just says jazz bass. Yeah, but in that says, like RoboCop font. <laughs> so awesome. Yeah, okay. Cool. Yeah, that font should have given it away that it's in the 90s. You're right. And do you know what's crazy to those string trees? <laughs> I think are actually the strap buttons that were on Kubicki Factor bases. <laughs> They probably had like part surplus, you know what I mean? And they took this, they took the like, they're like, oh, we got all these now. God, what do we do with all these? You know, that makes a lot of sense because the plastic does not like line up with anything else on this base. Isn't it's, like, that weird? Random. Yeah, those, those are the strap buttons that Kubicki used on their bases. It's but yeah, trashy. show us that. <laughs> I know it's a little trashy. Show us that, uh, show us that, that knob package again on the, on the base oh. there. Yeah, those are the Kubicki knobs. That's so cool. I That's have a really no cool idea. Base. That's so cool. Yep, Kubicki Electronics. Who is it active? Flip it over once. Uh, Can you, you have to put batteries in it. I do. I think it's honestly. I think it's both because I have the like. Yeah, the, there's pa there's like a rotary k k k k yeah. switch on it, right? That's yeah. like active and passive. Um, I just got it set up. I got. I haven't. Pff, this is embarrassing. People are gonna roast me. I because I got into bass way too early and i had no idea how anything works i didn't realize you're supposed to like set up bases so <laughs> my dad would like get them set up every yeah. now and then i had no idea about it i just suddenly would be like where's my base and it's like oh it's at the thing it's like okay cool no idea what he was doing right i get to berkeley and people are like you gotta set up your base i'm like okay cool so i like i learn how to like adjust the truss rod and i sure. know how to like 
weld and stuff. So whenever my electronics are bad, I, like, did you just do. say weld, dude? Yeah, like one time this base, so- the. <laughs> the, like the jack like got loose or stuff so i had to go in and i had to like reconnect it and stuff. some people would say it. solder well is it, is it <laughs> in german the word is we- in the german language the word is welding <laughs> or so, the translation for it anyway the, what i'm seeing right now is you with a mask on and a torch that's exactly what happened Ian. 100 i was in the middle of a rehearsal and I took my gear out of my gear bag. <laughs> Incredible. So the word for solder in German is weld. Do they well, make like a distinction? It's kind of like a, yeah. Is there a distinction between a solder iron that you fix electronics with and a welding torch? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Probably. I Not wonder. one that I used. I love, I love weld and I get it. It's just so funny. Incredible. But it's more badass. Because it like it so gives much. you the picture yeah, because of me you got and a mask. It'd Great. Be cool you know everybody... that, guys, I was welding my base. I put it on that huge table yeah. and I just shoved just with the torch. So you figured out how to do all that. You figured I out how to weld. I learned how to do it from the great Kai Eckhart. I don't know if you know about him or about. Him. I don't know him, but I, of course I've heard you talk about him. He's yeah, badass. He taught me half the shit I know about how to like set up a base. I love it. So it's really cool. Um, still never got the gist about like, oh, you have to like do that regularly. And then I got to Berkeley and I never set up any of my bases. So my six string, um, this one, and this one got to the point where it was just, the jack was so loose. He had to replace the thing. Oh, sure. Long story short, in June, I was like, I got a little bit of cash. I should probably do this right now. <laughs> yeah. So again, instead of buying an iPhone, I did the responsible thing. <laughs> you're, you're fixing your gear. Good for I you. I am. I yeah. am. Yep. Um, and I got three or four bases set up set for up. the first time in forever. And they feel like now I know why I wasn't playing some of these bases. Of course. Like, yes. It just didn't feel right. They feel good. They didn't sound good. They were fretting out. They were out of tune. Like just. Yes. Years and years of not not setting them up. And it's such a big like, deal. Yep. Don't ever sell that green base that you're holding right now. But if you do, sell it to me. <laughs> you know how many people have told me exactly that statement? Dana Hawkins. Oh, every yeah. time he sees me, he's like, do you still have that green base? I'm like, yes. <laughs> like, are you ready to sell it yet? No. <laughs> don't ever sell it. Every and time. if you do, don't sell it to Dana Hawkins. <laughs> sell it to me it's so cool i mean that that era for for guys i'm i wonder if dana and i are roughly the same age because that was coming out when i was a teenager you know and i was seeing them and they were cool and it was like oh the kabiki electronics and you know and then it went through a period where like that was not cool like you could get those bases for three four hundred dollars 250 maybe i mean dirt 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 cheap and now they're that was that would have probably been in the like Bots, you know why did you pay a lot of money for that base in the odds again i don't know this is one of those purchases that i just got handed yeah yeah yeah. remember that p base is the first base i bought for money <laughs> that's incredible this yeah because a- you've just been a bass player all your whole life since you were Christmas like three gift. yeah Ah, uh, that's cool. Yeah, those on the used market in the aughts, I, I maybe, I maybe stretching it a little bit. Maybe not two fifty, but they were not super valuable. And I bet those bases are, you know, up at least over a thousand bucks now to buy. You know, so they've gone, they've climbed. But yeah, I, I digress. I. Uh, the interesting thing is, so you've got some Fender Custom Shop componentry in that base there because of the Kubiki acquisition. But then check it out. So if we go back to Custom Shop, right, they they sell it back to Philip Kubiki, and then they're like, what do we do with this thing? And then they they think, I don't even know what the first base they did after the um, after the factors, but it's something like a jazz bass or a P bass, I'm sure. And they lean into making recreations of the old stuff. And I have to say, I have an old, uh, 65, like a legit 65 P bass. And I have this custom shop 58 P bass. And I want to like the old one, the like real one better. It's worth so much more money. 
Um, but I tend, when I pick up a P bass, I mostly, I toured with this one for a while. It sounds awesome with flats or rounds. I love it. Like if I had to just keep one P bass to have forever, it would actually be this one. Now, is it that one because you've spent so much time with it and you've put in the work? Do you think that you could get to the point with the other one? Maybe. Part of it is neck profile. I really mm -hmm. like chunky necks uh, front to back. And the other one is pretty thin. So I don't know. I really love the way this neck feels. It's also so solid. Something, too, that they use at the custom shop is quarter sawn necks, which is a little controversial because back in the day, they didn't use quarter sawn. Do you know that whole thing? Quarter sawn and flat sawn? So, like, imagine this. You can take wood out of a tree a variety of ways, right? There's a tree is like that, right? Yeah. And you could take the wood out of it this way and get oh, a lot, okay. right? Get a lot yeah. of wood. Or you could take it out this way or at some of an angle and you get less, less length. So you have to have giant trees to take the wood out at a cross section. Or, but if you, you could have a bunch of skinny trees and take it out the long way all day long, flat sawn wood, that's typical. Most instruments have that kind of construction. The grain runs. Mm -hmm. mm, I think I'm right about this. I don't know on flat sawn, but the grain looks sort of circular or kind of like you can see the, you can see sort of the rings. Yeah. Yep. Can you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Whereas. Yeah, you, you can kind of see some of the circles in it. And that's like typical flat sawn. And that's most instruments are like that. Even the old fenders are like that. But quarter sawn, the grain runs, you won't be able to see it here. The grain runs straight through this way. So the idea is that it's a more expensive piece of wood. It's harder to get. Um, and uh, twisting wise this way, like the way your truss rod acts, it's super stable. Yeah. So it doesn't move as much um, front to back. Now there are some people that say, oh, well, side to side, it has some movement. I don't know about that. But So is it more commonly used on like neck through bases? No. <clears throat> um, and on neck through bases, a lot of times they're laminated. It's right. They're like a bunch of chunks of wood stuck together. Hence like, the like pieces of the neck. And stuff, yes, yeah. exactly. And like with Spectre does uh, a three-piece maple neck construction. And if you cut chunks of wood and flip them around and put them together, you can essentially make a quarter sawn neck. You can turn the grain and right. put it together however you want. But to get a single piece of wood that is quarter sawn where the grain goes this way. It's just a completely different animal. And the Fender custom shop uses that stuff. And I'm, and there are other, you know, probably Capolo and there are other manufacturers that use it too. And what you get then is just this incredibly solid, almost graphite esque. Like it's very stable. So, you know, you don't have to adjust them. You'd never you like, you set it up one time and then it's pretty much good to go. It changes a little like bit. like my perfect thing. I know. Yeah, it's 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 amazing. And that's that's one thing where I feel like people don't know that fact about the custom shop. I'm trying to think like USA Lakelands do that too. I'm trying to think of other manufacturers like here's here's something like Lull doesn't do it. They use flats on, but then they inlay graphite rods in the Ooh. neck. So that it's sort of acting and their whole thing is they want the stability, but they think the flat sawn wood actually sounds better and more, you know, so it really does get into the weeds, but this neck, because of its thickness, because it's made out of quarter sawn maple, it like never, ever, ever moves. And it's just awesome. So, and even like when you pull it, you go, oh, wow, this is really, you know, how you can kind of like feel if a neck moves yeah. just by sort of like pulling it against you. This thing just feels like a piece of stone or something. <laughs> and that's cool. That's cool. So that is the main thing I like, I will say about the custom shop is they have this incredible access to quarter sawn maple. That's like the biggest thing for me that is amazing about them. And it makes them sound and feel different than the vintage ones. Mm. Um, but it makes them super, super stable and like, feel like they'll just last 
forever yeah. and ever and ever, yeah. which is cool. Um, but they're expensive. And do they sound better than Squire basses? <laughs> <laughs> tell me what, tell me, um, because I've played some squires over the years and I have thoughts, but I've just talked a lot. Do you have thoughts about your squire base? You have some I mean, really expensive stuff and yes. you have a squire. I mean, you've got a ding wire and you have a super nice German made Warwick six string thumb. Those are multi thousand dollar instruments. Uh, and you also have that cool jazz bass that you're holding there. And when that came out, that was probably over a grand. And then you've got, a squire, how much was it? Four fifty, something like that. Ballpark, like super cheap. Yep. And it was like the cheapest one in the store at where I went. Yes. One of the cheaper bases. Um. So you were you were kind of there while I was debating which base to get, and I was trying to get a, a classic Fender P. Yeah. And. All the peas that I tried, all the fenders that I tried, I was just like, uh, uh, you know, it just didn't feel right. What? Why? And what I, do you What do you mean? The neck. It was like just not. I didn't get around the neck huh. like, well at all. It was just like. Do you feel like it was set up? Was it like were, were the ones in the shop like really high? Um. So one thing that I love about this space is that it's a matte finish. Yes. The squire, the squire. So on the back literally of the neck, the sliding of yeah, the back of the uh, neck. So the yeah. sliding of the back of the neck is so smooth. Yes, like, compared to any other base that I have, the Dingwall right. has a pretty matte-ish neck, so it's very. That's one of the things that I love about the Dingwall as well. But I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but it's made of guilt. Out of... <laughs> I felt a pang of guilt right there. But you have a Dingwall on the way. <laughs> I don't know. Fine. We'll see. Um, that one also is made out of Wenge, which is a completely just different right. tactile sensation. Like I love the Wenge necks that they use, but it's very different than the typical right. like Fender Maple thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So the neck was definitely the first thing that that pulled me in. I did not buy the base though. I I left all of them. I was like, I don't think I'm ready to buy a base today because. I want to get a Fender. Yep. But I don't like any of them. The only bass I like is a Squire. And oh my God, I can't spend my money on a Squire. <laughs> <laughs> that was literally my thought. And I was yeah. like, mm, I, can't, I can't. So I left. I didn't buy a bass. I went well, home. Hold on a minute. I have to stop you. Why did you feel that way? I just. Every Squire that I've played up until that moment, whether it's someone else's bass or tried just you know, go to Guitar Center and just try basses because you have free period. Yes. <laughs> um, and I never liked them. So I, there's a part of me that was just like, Ugh, lame. I don't like you. Right. On principle. Right. Did it have anything with the, with the S word instead of the F word? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, does branding to you, was it just, be honest, was it just your experience playing the instruments or is there something larger about brand that you care about where the S word is not going to hit you like the F word does? Um, there probably was because after that day we had, we, I came back and like a day or two later we had a content meeting and I was talking to you and Scott and Scott was like, it's such a flex, though, if you can make a squire sound good. And I was like, mm, I like that angle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It kind of is. I mean, you know. Right. And then I was like, well, I did enjoy it. Like, out of all the bases. And I tried all the bases in the store. I was there for, like, three hours. The guys hated me. And I didn't buy a base in the end. <laughs> and they were <Right>. like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I go back. And I'm like, I try it again just to be like, okay, now I'm coming in with a clean slate what you guys said kind of like evened it out. It evened the playing field. It didn't make it go over Fender, the name, yes. but it, at least it removed the negative tone that is Squire. So, yeah. And, and it's, it's interesting, right? Like that. I, I am very, the reason I ask, I'm not trying to like out you or, or like be like, Oh, oh no, no, you. no. Yeah. Because I have that in spades. I have that thing. I need the headstock to have the F word on it. I need it. 
<laughs> um, and and that's not cool. Like, and I love the idea. Scott is right that it is a bit of a flex to like you're a pro bass player and you're playing and you're choosing to play a squire. <laughs> you could play something else, but you've made a choice to play a squire. You know, like Reggie Wooten, Victor's brother, famously has played this squire strat from the '80s forever. It's like a white squire strat, and he, you know, and he's amazing. Um, but. I so it's interesting to me you played it you liked it but there was something about brand where you didn't pull the trigger on it until you had some justification or or a little bit of push from your peers maybe that it wasn't so uncool but <laughs> on that same conversation um I think it was Scott he was like, yeah, you, essentially you get the Squire and then you remove everything. You like change the electronics. And the only thing that's really Squire about it is, is the freaking head drop. Sure, like, sure. Okay. And I was like, okay, I can do that because I have that four string um, Reggie Hamilton signature that's just sitting around and the neck is completely wrecked. Ah, uh, yes. So I was like, well, maybe I can somehow like take all the pieces because it's such a badass. Um, it is. A, I think it's a P bass. It's such a badass bass. And the electronics are super cool. It's got that drop D. Yeah, hip shot on so it. So I was yes. like, oh, maybe I'll like do that. So I bought the bass with the full intent because I know I'm going to go and bring all my basses to set up. I'll just bring the dude, those two basses, and he can like. <laughs> and he can swap it. Yep, right. sure. Then I started playing with the bass, and I was like, I am not changing a thing. That's amazing. Space. And that was the part where I surprised myself because I was, I bought it thinking I was going to go and do that to the bass. And nothing has changed on except the strings. I changed the flats. Although I loved I loved the strings that were on and I saved them. Just oh yeah. I to and back. put them back. I mean No, I, because I don't have another flat wound bass right now. Uh, so I want to just it, yeah. I, I love having a flat wound <laughs> yeah. and because I got the five string set up again, I have a bright nice like round wound fender sound, so I don't need that. Yes, from got it. Wire. So I'm, 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 it takes a lot on a day to day basis. I'm like, maybe I'll change. But then I, it means I have to change the strings, which is something that I don't want to do oh anyway. Oh my God. But, I, I love changing strings. I love it. It's one of my favorite things to do, actually. I love the, I love the getting the windings just right around the post. I like watching the movie. <laughs> I, and then I'm like, every, every knob is like, Everyone is different. I'm like, oh, no, that's up. No, that's that. Oh, oh okay. I, I screwed it up. I guess we're just going to have to get used to it. That's how I had it on the six string for the long time. Oh, my God, Each dude. Each one was like a different direction, and it did not work. Oh, um, my God. So for this one, I was watching a YouTube video because I haven't changed strings in years, and I was like, let's do it right. <laughs> I'm going to do it right. Yeah. And I sat down, and it took me like half an hour. I would lose at the string change challenge. And I was like, <laughs> you would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, next time, if you have to do it, just jump. Let's just jump on a call, and I'll take you through it. It's my I mean, favorite now I thing know to do. How, yeah. But I mean, I already knew how, but now I like know the yeah. how to not get myself confused and like whether I'm turning it left, right, how I'm going of around. Of course. It can be so intimidating, for sure. And especially on an instrument that, yeah, like I feel that way on upright. I had to change a string on an upright once and I was like, oh my God, this is so scary. And it wasn't actually in the end that scary, but I felt the panic of like, I'm going to do this wrong. I have never and, changed my strings on the upright. Yeah. That's never going to happen. <laughs> no. Never going to happen. <laughs> never going to happen. Um, so you have this squire and you love it. And I feel like we should play them a little. I mean, I know we probably have different front ends. People are probably like, play it do they sound different Here, here's something i will say um i remember when we shot the steve harris video and you and like you were playing yours and i had kind of some amp emulation going and i thought your bass sounded really good and i was kind of like damn that thing sounds really good and there is this weird thing where if you're like me and you've you know and you've spent decades tone chasing and instrument chasing and you find something you're like this is the best p bass ever and then you hear it and then someone else plays one that is you know 10 times cheaper or whatever and you're like oh that one sounds really good <laughs> <laughs> i think like for everybody out there who's wondering about sound i actually don't think the tone of very of p basses 
is very different. Obviously, if you A B'd a bunch of P bases, you'll you'll notice differences. But that split coil P pickup is so signature and so like I don't know, for me it's like putting green peppers on a pizza. It's all I taste. There's something about that pickup that is like so um strong that Wait, even just on, that design. Yeah. Man, you distracted me with green peppers on pizza. <laughs> yeah. Do you like green peppers on pizza? I don't actually like green peppers on oh, pizza. That breaks my heart. Really? <laughs> there is, Ian, when you come to Boston, there's, yeah. this, there's this pizza place called Stoked. And yeah. it is so good. And they have a pizza. I'm sorry. Massive digression. Let's go. It I is, love pizza. It's a pizza. Great. Like oven everything. Um, And it's got smoked honey bacon. And I'm, they actually have like honey like oh yeah it's like sweet it's i'll eat sweet. i'll eat that pizza with green peppers that are fire roasted yeah i would do that and i would do that so good Ian. It's i mean the look, best pizza look look i'm gonna eat the green peppers on the pizza i'm a freaking adult you know what i'm saying like there was a time where i would like pick them off i don't do that anymore i'm an adult i'm gonna eat the pizza you take me to that pizza place i'm eating that pizza i just would never choose like I'm, I like bell peppers okay. I'm eating a red pepper. Sure. I'm going to eat an orange pepper. Yellow? Sure. Green? Hmm. Green peppers on a pizza take over. Just like I know people feel that way about olives. They feel that way about mushrooms. They feel that way about pineapple. Pineapple. Sure. But I feel that way about green peppers. And I think that that's the same thing that okay. like a pea base pickup. It's so that strong. That's a great, great comparison. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And it good. kind of like... It makes all P bases, for better or for worse, sort of sound the same. I would I would absolutely challenge anybody blind. Now, if you're not feeling the instrument, right, to listen to a bunch. I'm sure there's a gazillion P bass shootouts out there. Different pickups, Nordstrand, Aguilar, Fender, Lawler. There's so many things. And yes, side by side, you can hear small differences. But in a mix, boy, oh boy, they're so similar. More similar, I think, than jazz bass pickups. And it, it's it's good for people out there that want to get a P bass that don't want to spend a gazillion dollars on an old one or a custom shop. It's bad, though, for guys like me that have pined away and tried to buy the ultimate P bass, which is a fallacy. It's a fallacy. The, the Holy Grail does not exist. You know, like I get this bass. I'm like, oh, this is the best P bass ever. Like it sounds so good and big. And then, you know, I hear someone else play a Squire P bass. I'm like, that one sounds big and good, too. <laughs> Crap, I could have bought an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Crap, I could have I could have prioritized this money probably in a better way. Check this out though. I want, I want to know if you have this with anything else in your life. I know you don't have this with bases, but I have this thing where if I buy the budget option of a base, I don't have this with everything in my life. I don't care about buying budget furniture or, or cutlery or, you know what I mean? Like I don't need to buy the most expensive, um, crap always, obviously, but with bases, I have this thing where if I bought that Squire, okay, if I was like, no, 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 Squires are sick. It's a flex. I'm going to do it. I played gyms at SBL. It was awesome. Sharon sounds great. I'm getting a Squire and I bought it. There is this thing in the back of my mind always that is like, but it's not like if you just would have saved up a little more, you would have, you know, you would have bought this and it'd be better. And that plagues me every step of the way until I get to the 1965, you know, some f amazing, incredible vintage thing. So you, you go to the top of the mountain. What I'm saying, Sharon, is you climb and climb and climb and climb and climb. And then you get the freaking, you know, 65 P base that, you know, is so they're so it's beautiful mm -hmm. and it's worth a ton of money. It's worth almost three times what I paid for it now. And that's the top of the mountain for me, right? That's the top of the mountain. And then I still don't like it as well as something cheaper. And it's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem for me.
I'm like, oh, oh, but if if you just would have, I think it comes from old Bob Allison when I was a little kid. He's like, save up your money and buy the, you know, I was going to buy like a little boom box, you know, to listen to music. And he's like, well, this one is a little better. So save up your money and get the, get this one. Okay. And so I did. And I was like, yeah, that that's how I need to live my life. And then I do that with bases where I'm like, I need the best one that, that I, within reason, right? I need the best one because I'll always have this thing nagging in me of like, oh, you should have just, you should have just waited. You should have just prioritized it differently. Mm-hmm. And it's not healthy. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> so with bases. Yeah. Um, Generally, I'd say with anything I buy, I have a, I agree, really? incredibly unhealthy. Everything. Yeah. Perfect example. Yesterday, um, a friend told me about uh, a video game that's coming out this month. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's the new Skyrim. And so I go and check and it's only coming out on PS5. Not PS4. Got it. I have a PS4. Right. iPhone. PS5. <laughs> yes. Not a priority. Got it. But now this game is only on PS5. So I'm like, oh, crap, do I have to get a PS5? And then I'm like, but the PS5 has already been out for two years, which means they're probably going to release a PS5 Pro or a PS5 sure. Slim or something soon. Do I really want to be buying that? And then in three months, they're going to be like, here's the newer, better version. And yeah. I was that idiot who bought the shitty one like, yep. three months before. Sure. So I'm not going to do that. Like, perfect example. Yes. Number one, with bases. If I can get someone that I whose opinion I respect to like the P base to tell me that hey maybe it's not a bad idea, I can tell that little voice in my head to leave. You can justify it, and then it'll work. Yeah, and then I mean that actually like it. I love that base. I will not sell that base right. either. Like even if I for some reason got my hands on your base, I would still not sell this one. Sure. Well, and, and you know, it's that thing you mentioned earlier. It's about time too. like, you're going to put in hours you already have on that base. And like, then what's really cool. What's an amazing flex is like, maybe you would get this base and I'm, I'm saying, oh, this is amazing. You might hate this neck profile. It's huge. It's awful for some people. You might be like, oh, I don't like this at all because I'm, I got so used to my squire and that's healthy. That's good. So I have a really funny story about that. My dream base since I was probably 14 was a Federa. Yes. There's nothing I wanted more than a Federa in the whole damn world. I just, I would watch every Federa video out there the second someone dropped a video with Federa. And I am not base obsessed. Like, you know, you know that. I know. Yeah, that's true. I'll just take a, but great. Right, except Rickenbacker. I will. Take Rickenbacker. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, you tried to steal. You tried to steal mine. <laughs> um, and I really wanted that Federa. Yeah. And then when I got to Berkeley, I my one of my PI instructors was Lincoln Goins, who has a Federa, loves Federa, is a Federa artist, and he let me play his Federa. And I thought, oh, this, it's pretty sweet. I was I was a little disappointed with how it felt, but then I was like, yeah, but it's his base, it's his setup, it's how he. Sure, did. sure, yep. Great. He connected me to Federa. And then when I moved to New York, I got in touch with them and they were like, hey, come on, check out our bases. And then we'd love to like work with you and make your base. And I was like super, 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 super stoked. How old were you at this point? I was 17 or 18. Holy crap, dude. Mind you, their artist discount is like 15% off of like a $16 base. So 17, 18 year old me did not have that money to begin with. So I was like, hey, dad, 16, wait, 16, 17 thousand dollar base. Yes. 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 So, like so it's expensive. Yeah. So like artist discount, 15% off of 15. Yeah, it's or, like, it's still going to be 15 or 14 grand. Like it's, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm like, well, I just finished college. So maybe I was like 20, 21 at yep. that point. I just finished college and I go and check out this thing and I talked to my dad and he was like, look, if it's really what you want, I can help you finance it and you can like totally pay it back and whatnot. Okay. Okay. So I go and I spend a day there or like half a day and they show me everything. They run me through their woods and it was, it was so beautiful. It was my first time ever at a base shop to begin with. And it's like Federa, like, wow. Wow. Right. Pinnacle. I know. And I meet, I meet Vinny and I meet a bunch of like, uh, of the folks at Federa, and then they're like, "So you've seen the shop, you've seen everyone who like makes the bases what they are. We'll we're gonna let you just 
take an hour and you can go into the, like the playroom and they have like I don't know how I can't remember how many bases 20 25 bases just hanging and you can play every single one with like three amps ready yeah. for you so I'm in there for an hour and I left no longer wanting to there wow shots fired <laughs> <laughs> and I was so disappointed. My heart broke. I was like, none of these bases. Because at that point, I mean, it's still really to this day. I, my, my number one, my go-to base is my six-string Warwick base. Yep. You've had and that a long time. for the longest, right. Yep. For the longest time, I was telling myself, I'm going to have the six-string up until I get my Federa. It's my, wow. it's my base for everything. But I was always like, mm, I think we're to like get a Warwick thing going. But I want my Federa. Sure. The Federa so, was the white whale. Right. But. My my six string was my like threshold. Yep. You cannot go like below the six string. And everyone who has played that six string is like, oh shit, I really like this. Can you want to trade? Like everyone, it's like a really comfortable base. Never mind the fact that it's like three thousand pounds heavy. <laughs> yeah. If you're seated, it's a great base. Right. So I, I like, I had very high expectations, wow. and I go in, and none of these bases to me would have replaced my six string and that was not the point like it, that was the point that was i the wanted point. You were... i wanted my base for everything and yes the federas are not that they're not a base for everything oh you wanted to ascend to the next level the 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 warwick is now is now gone you thought the Fodera was going to be the pinnacle of everything that it was going to beat that it was going to empirically be better than an instrument that you've put thousands and thousands of hours into. I mean, yeah. part of that is on you. 100%. <laughs> I mean, way too high expectations. Yeah, way yeah. too high. But I totally high. get it. I get it, though. And 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 can we say, I don't hear you saying that Foderas are bad. Absolutely not. They're a very specific kind of bass for a very specific kind of thing. Agreed. Which, again, is a thing that I love. Also, to be noted, when I when I started like fantasizing about Federas, all I played was fusion jazz. Right. Growing up, like for probably six or seven years, like from like twelve to wow eighteen. So what it you're was, listening to Tony Gray, Tony Gray, Yannick, Yannick Wisdala, yes. and then like steps ahead, I any steps ahead song, any weather report song, all of it. Like I went through my Jocko phase, all on the six string. Yes. Everything. Wow. And so I wanted a Federa because that's the Federa sound. Of it's course. Like yes. Fusion. It's, it's so good in fusion jazz. Now I got to Berkeley and I started playing Gent, Prog, and like all of these things. And it, not that I wasn't somewhat diverse, a, a diverse player when I got to Berkeley because of like where I come from. I played pop and whatnot, but I wasn't, I was still in the Berkeley mindset. Sure. Where, oh, everything is like. But when I played that bass, I felt caged interesting and i couldn't justify spending 14 to fifteen thousand dollars on oh. a base that is not going to be useful to me in every situation well i will say this of course and at 20 yes and good <laughs> for you because that is so much pressure first of all it's it's your dream company they're offering you an artist discount Whoa, i mean that's like a you know as a teenager at any point in the game when someone is like hey we are honoring you and we see you in this way versus all those other plebeian bass players just you know what i mean they they prop you up with that you know with that little discount and then they invite you and they're showing you the wood and you're like oh this is going to be amazing and then you play it good for you for not just being like well i must not get it yet i should probably just get it and I'll, i will fall in love with it you know like good for you for being like ah i just don't think it was my thing was it really disappointing it was very disappointing but i for about another two years i was thinking i was like okay the only the only way I could justify getting a Federa is if I get a base made that I don't have, which is a five or six string fretless. Mm, mm -hmm. So maybe if I get them to make me a five or six string fretless Federa, I can justify that. And after two years of kind of like deliberating, it just didn't. It I'm didn't like, happen. Might as well get like a Tobias or something that. Sure. That didn't cost you 15 <laughs> yeah, grand. Like yeah. Many well, iPhones. Um, that's crazy. 
Um, Still, it breaks my heart to this day, though. <laughs> I remember. I remember walking. I remember the feeling I had walking in, and I remember the feeling I had walking out, and it was just polar opposites. And it was just like, yeah. Oh man! And to have to say, like, do you remember what you I said? I did not look them in the face and say that. I could not, and I still to this day, my I think my email might have been. I'm just gonna think on it a little bit longer, and that's probably where I left it. I actually thank have you to go so much, guys. You're right. yeah, 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 because I was grateful. Of, I was, of course, I mean, you were. Of course, yeah. God, imagine I spent like close to twenty grand on this base, and I'm like, hey, guys, I hate it. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I never play it. Wow. I, um, let me tell you this. I went into base Northwest in the nineties, which was in Seattle and, uh, looking to get something else. I was a teenager. I was probably 17 and there was a used four string Monarch Fodera. And for me also Fodera was a big deal. Now that was before Yannick and Tony, but it was Victor, right? So Victor yeah. was playing. Victor started to play one in the eighties. Mm-hmm. I came up and thought, "Oh, well, Fodera is the it's the pinnacle of the boutiques. Of course, that's what I want." And they had a beautiful like Buckeye, but it was like light colored. It wasn't like that greeny Buckeye Monarch, the similar model to what Victor plays four string, and it had Lane Poor pickups in it, which were, were different. They usually use EMGs in those models, but they had these different pickups. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I sat down and played it and died. I thought it, so I had the opposite experience of you. I absolutely fell in love with this space, but at the time it was prohibitively expensive. I think at the time it was $4,000. <laughs> which is, you know, um, that would have been 96 probably. And I, I think it was like four grand and I was there to buy something that was like 1800. So it was double my budget. There was no way I'd saved up a bunch of money and I left. And then I just continuously would check the internet. I would like go and like dial up at my dad's house. <laughs> You don't even know what that sound means. Oh, and- <laughs> I do. I do, Ian. This one I grew up with. <laughs> yeah. Right? And and that, you know, I would see. And then one day it was gone. And I was like, oh, my God. And it crushed me. And it has been for the longest time the one that got away. And it is interesting because, <laughs> can I tell you, I've, I don't think I've ever told anybody this before. I considered getting a Fodera tattoo. <laughs> Would it be like a tramp stamp, like right above your butt? Because that would be glorious. <laughs> the butterfly <laughs> yeah. right above my butt? No. I was going to get it on my wrist. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was going to be the butterfly, dude. The F with the wings, you know, because I was like, I'm going to find that base someday or I'm going to get one someday. And I almost preemptively got a Fodera tattoo. And I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> you still don't have a Fodera, do you? I don't. So here's what <laughs> happened to me. Um, I loved that bass that I played, and I'm like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get one of those someday. Thought about getting the tattoo, didn't get it, all good. But then my taste changed. So I went way more in the kind of like vintage zone. Um, I started to play with artists where that was sort of the value. I started to do more sessions where active basses were not cool. It was not the thing. Show up with an active bass in any of the sessions that I was doing, and it was like, you were the wrong fit, wrong person. No, no, no. Old P bass, old jazz bass, old hollow body. That was the vibe. And so I, I let it go. But I've always kind of wanted one, right? But I have had the experience now where the the fives and sixes that I've played, I have not fallen in love in the same way. Like, of course, they're beautiful. Of course, they're really nice. But there is sort of like a, there is like a mid-range characteristic to those instruments that I don't yes. love personally. 100. And that is exactly what bothered me. Yes. Now. They're almost like a nasal and, yeah. and and a lot of those boutique companies have that they have a high end signature in their sound. Like I think that Ken Smith has that. 
Mm-hmm. And I really, I've learned to kind of like embrace that and love it in a way. It's not right for everything. Fodera has a different kind of mid-range signature. Spectre has a different high-end mid-range signature. They all have these kind of textural sounds in the high mid-range that really give them their character. Mm-hmm. And I think that's cool, but it's not, I don't like it in the Fodera enough to justify spending the money, I guess. That's what I'll say. Um, because the money is outrageous. Agree. Yeah. yeah. It is. It really is. Again, it'd be one of those bases, like, if it accidentally fell into my lap, like, <coughs> bing wall, I would <laughs> play it, probably. <laughs> but... Well, I mean, I'll to say the ding wall completely opposite experience. I mean, I love the first time I saw it was me editing the video of you comparing it to the Gibson. Yep. And I fell in love just with the way it looked and how you played it. Ah, I was like, oh, mama, (laughs) what is this bass? Oh, mama. (laughs) That gold was like, oh, it killed me. It was just so beautiful. And I just. Like in the by and by, mentioned it to Nick. I was like, "That is one hella gorgeous bass." And he was like, "Do you want it?" I'm like, "What?" <laughs> he took it away from me. You know, <laughs> completely unintentional. Dingwalls have that thing too. They have like a a signature, but you just like it. Ding the Dingwall definitely has a sound and a, and a sound in the upper mid range or high end that is very characteristic, and you like it. But there is something about it that is heavier yes like there is a weight in the tone and the feel you're right wall that is not there on the federa it mm. literally is like there's a feather that's the federa and then there's this like bowling ball Damn. but they have the same like they're coming from the same place but that's like that's the difference of how they feel hmm. and that is just a bowling ball that cuts Totally. Yes. Whereas a Fodera is maybe it needs to be more nimble or something. Right. Yeah. Like, like it needs to yeah. be, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to justify it. I agree with you though. I like the signature, but I'm, I come from like a rock place. It's just interesting. Like you're Miss Fusion or you were. Except I, I really like, I, I really leaned into the heavier music. Yes. At Berkeley, which is like the opposite of what everyone else does. They like, Play pop and then they get to Berkeley and they're like jazz and I'm like jazz I get to Berkeley and I'm like no <laughs> like complete complete funny story again quick yes. digression my dad he went to Berkeley in the 80s yeah and he was there at the same time as Dream Theater crazy um, and they would all rehearse at like seven in the morning back in the days where you didn't have to book your ensemble rooms and they would just show up seven in the morning and they had like their like designated rooms that they preferred and his room happened to be right next to Dream Theater at the exact same time every morning brutal and they would try and do their like cool train stuff and whatnot and next door you've got like <laughs> and it, they just couldn't hear themselves so my dad has this like inherent hate for dream theater for no other reason than the fact that he could not hear himself practicing <laughs> respects them as musicians is like but they're assholes because i couldn't practice at seven in the morning that's incredible <laughs> so yeah. then the first thing i did when i got to berkeley which is completely unintentional but poetic was join a dream theater <laughs> just breaking your father's heart he's like uh but you know what we did a video it's probably it, i remember it being amazing it's probably not that good it's somewhere on youtube i do not recommend finding it oh, although find i it learned those this. bass parts in three days and we went to the session i was very proud of that but yeah, anyways those are hard bass parts um we posted that video and he shared it and was saying how proud he was your dad Yes, oh, which is like you shared a dream theater video, my man. That is <laughs> well. I mean, you know, okay, you can hate dream theater all you want, but anybody knows monstrous, monstrous chops. And he saw his baby girl rock that, rock those John my own licks. Plus, it was like first semester Berkeley video out. Like it Hell was like yeah. a big like moment. That's yeah, bad so. ass. Yeah, it was, it was. It was sweet. It was very very sweet. Anecdotal moment. Did you play that all on your thumb? The thumb. I did Warwick? play everything on yep. that thumb. Yep. And literally, I met the guy, and he was like, "My bassist dropped out. I don't have a bassist for the session. Do you know Dream Theater?" And I was like, "Never checked them out. Never checked them out." He's <laughs> like, "There's these three songs. We did the first three songs of um, Dreams, Scenes of a Scenes of a Memory, memory Two. So Overture." I can't remember the titles. 
the first three songs. Amazing. And he's like, can you like learn those? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You're like, of course. It's just no bass. No idea what I'm signing up for. He's like, like, it's I just one death, note at a time. I can do this. <laughs> yeah, who cares? And, then you're and like, I go oh home and I listen and I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's heavy. It's difficult music to play. I got blown away. My uncle gave me two CDs for my 15th, well, it was Christmas when I was 15. It was UFO Tofu by Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. So it was Victor. Ooh. And it was uh, the second Dream Theater record, which was called Images and Words. Mm. And that was like two records before yours, before Scenes from a Memory. Um, but, you know, so Victor Wooten, John Myung, I was off to the races. I mean, 15, like I'd been playing bass for two years. I was kind of into Rush and into pop music. And that really took me in that direction. Oh, I got way into Victor, way into like metal prog music. Yeah. It was great. It was My great. biggest regret in bass music, in like learning music and bass is not getting into prog earlier. Really? That is by far my biggest regret. Your biggest I think, regret? Yes, because it, prog, not metal per se, or heavy metal, or heavy like rock, prog. There is so much more there than just bass technique and all. There is, of course. There's like rhythm, harmony, on a whole new level. Yes. And it's in a completely different way than jazz. Like it's util it very similar things to jazz, but utilized completely differently in a way that actually speaks to me way more. That I am so annoyed <laughs> that I wasn't exposed to that wow. early on. Because I feel like people who were exposed to it early on, they have a completely different skill set for a long time. And they and it's like their foundation. Yep. And that that having that as a foundation makes you a completely different player. And I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> it kills me. Oh, like, I love that. Like limping behind. Like, I, got this <laughs> I love that. You're having your prog renaissance. Well, hey, look, you're not you're not fifty two years old. You know what I mean? I I'm almost fifty two. <laughs> <laughs> you look damn good for fifty two, Shaz. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, you know, you've done the opposite of Scott because Scott came up listening to, I mean, he was never a rush guy, but he was listening to, you know, Steve Vai and, oh, and I, maybe Genesis. I don't know if Genesis is right, but then he did the opposite. He got super into fusion and left Prague behind, you know, doesn't really like, yes, doesn't really like dream theater. Doesn't really like rush. I know. Oh, yeah. And okay. Okay. What's your favorite prog band right now? If you've got, a, if you've got a wreck for people, uh, what's, do you have a band or a, or a, did I put you on the spot? Now you're like, I don't actually like prog. No, I, I love prog. Yeah. Again, I'm still, I know a lot of it by, by hearing. I, I don't play a lot of it because I don't have the, surrounding to play yeah. like, live that being said the people that i have experienced playing live um are my friends and i've listened to a lot of their music and that is the music that i would recommend because it is bad. well give so, us the wreck what is it one of them and these are both bands that i that i covered in my prog video actually yes number one is the last song on my prog video Stemothy, by the band hago they only have one album but it is such pure genius awesome and it's because they're israeli there's like this mix of middle eastern influence with prog and they call it falafel gent <laughs> <laughs> i love it it's amazing and it's just it's just beautiful music cool. it's more than just heavy or badass it's yes also beautiful music yes um and then same guitarists and drummers from distorted harmony which is also a band that i covered in that incredible stuff they have like three or four albums cool incredible albums and then yeah the av like i i really got into um pain of salvation and stuff like that which are of course earlier prog and then rush which you got me into did i because you, you checked out uh you checked out moving pictures right moving pictures when i edited that video that i knew okay this is very funny i knew one song by rush or I yeah sure I didn't know it was Rush, but I knew one song. And what? the second I started editing your video, I was like, oh, my God, is that the same singer? Yeah. Is that song? <laughs> and uh, yes. the song that I knew was Fly By Night. Oh, Fly sure. Fly By Night. Yeah, da, of course. Da, da. Yep. And I, until that moment, 
of editing the video and seeing Getty Lee yep. sing that, I swear to God, I thought it was a woman singing. Of course. <laughs> well, and, I mean, oh, and you know, when Getty started, it was just that crazy, like banshee, shrill top. He's, I mean, geez, what a, what a career, you know, he's turned 70. So crazy. Um, but yeah, Getty has been doing it and they've had all these phases, you know, the, where they started out, they sounded like Zeppelin and then they moved into kind of, you know, these epic giants album sprawling 20 minute songs. And then they kind of brought it in tight in the eighties. And then they, you know, got a little more rock and roll and Zeppelin -y again in the nineties. And anyway, it's just, they've had quite the career. You should, you should dive in deeper. I, I have completely enveloped myself with rush. We are for, we're trying for our Berkeley Indian ensemble set list. We tend to have like a metal. We tend to toss a metal cover in. Right now, we have "For Whom the Bell Tolls" Amazing. by Metallica. It's great, which I sing, which is super fun. Oh, so fun! Um, and the next one we're trying to do is YYZ. <laughs> oh, you should! Oh, that would be so we're fun. So, YYZ so is excited. amazing. And we're gonna add like conical over it. We'll have like oh, doing like cool. crazy conical over YYZ. We're excited. Oh my so, god! Definitely. Like if you guys do it, you should send it. You know, we we gotta get it get uh, Alex Lifeson and Getty to get eyes on that. I bet they would dig it. I, I think so. <sighs> we didn't, I didn't even say this. I'll say this in the intro, but you are amazing. Thank you so much for hanging out today and filling in, filling in for my better half. <laughs> it's still FBL, man. <laughs> You're my Sharon better half today. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> it's so funny. What did I told Everly that we were going to do this? I'm like, Oh, Sharon and I are going to do it. So it's the Sharon and Ian show. And, and she just said, <laughs> it should just be called the Sharon show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I was like, yeah. dang burn. Oh my God. She was like, or, or maybe she was like, make it like something like the Sharon. Oh, what did she say? It was really good. It was like, you know, it was some awesome alliteration. It wasn't the Sharon extravaganza, but it was something like that. But the second word began with S. Now I just don't have it. <laughs> oh, man, but, that's great. But you're awesome. So, I mean, everybody give a round of applause Thank to Sharon you. for so hanging out. Fun. This was my first ever pod. Yeah, I know. It was exciting. And we just got into it. And I feel like I f we had all these other things that we could have talked about, but we, we did didn't need it. Talk about. Did we need it? <laughs> we need no. that at all. But you guys, hey, um, shoot us that uh, shoot us that rating. Give, leave us a comment, subscribe to the podcast channel on YouTube. If you're checking it out there, we're with you every single week. It is the Sharon and Ian show today on the SBL podcast. Very fun. Uh, yeah. So let us know um, in the comments too. What do you think? Like, have you had experiences with bases that you put on pedestals that fell off? Do you, do you love Squire? Do you love Fender custom shop? I mean, I'm curious. I would love to get, you know, make friends in the comments, you guys comment and uh, let's get that community going. We're in there too. We read that stuff. We read, we respond. So let us know your experiences and, you know, of course we're going to catch you again in the next one. So thank you for watching, for listening. We'll see you in the next one, everybody.